Welcome to the Renal Pathophysiology Lecture. I'm just going to cover some of the main points that you need to know about the kidney and try and simplify or clarify or allow you to see it in a different way. We're going to start with the major functions of the kidney. The first is filtration. This occurs at the glomerulus. Our goal of the kidney is to remove toxic waste products from the blood. The most common that you I want you to think about is urea, which is a byproduct of protein breakdown. The second job is reabsorption. So in the glomerulus, we're filtering out majority of our blood and we need to be able to reabsorb some of those products based on how much we need in the body. So this occurs in the tubules or the rest in the nephron and it's supposed to maintain the volume and composition of the blood. So you're going to see different electrolytes, bicarbonate to maintain acid base balance and water reabsorbed. Now, of the 99% that's filtered, less than 1% is excreted, so the rest is absorbed. The third purpose is secretion of vitamin D in the active form and erythropoietin. So individuals with chronic kidney disease who have failure of this secreting mechanism won't have erythropoietin, and that will make it so that they have anemias and difficulty creating new red blood cells. And number four is blood pressure regulation. Remember that the heart is in charge of only increasing low blood pressure to normal, but the kidneys control everything else. So let's start with the renal anatomy. I want you to pay attention to the fact that there's a cortex and a medulla. Now, most of the important parts of the nephron are going to be included in the cortex. The loop of Henle, as well as the collecting duct, are the portions that are in the medulla. As far as the renal blood flow goes, I've traced it for you right here, starting with first the arterial flow. Comes in from the renal artery off the aorta, into the segmental artery, up into the interlobar artery, and then the arcuate artery, that kind of anastomosis at the top. Additionally, there's the cortical radiate artery, which is also called interlobular, I apologize, artery. Now from there, that's just getting to the glomerular system. We'll talk about the glomerular system blood flow itself in just a second because it's very unique. Here's the venous return, which follows the exact same path as the arterial system. Now, as far as glomerular blood flow goes, it's one of the three portal systems in the body. And the reason that it's so unique is because it has two of these arterioles that control flow into the first glomerular capillary. Then it continues down the rest of the nephron and the paratubular capillaries are what return the blood to the heart through the renal vein. Now this allows us to have very tight control of exactly how much fluid is going into the glomerulus. If we dilate one side versus the other, we can control more or less. This is how I want you to think about it. Now you can turn both sides of a faucet on and have a lot of fluid go into the sink. But if you turn one of those off, then you're changing it to hot or cold water and you have a lot less fluid going in and out. So that's just kind of an analogy that helped me understand it. Now here's the combined blood flow. If you were able to learn it in those parts and now feel comfortable, you can look at the whole picture together straight from the renal artery all the way through the glomerular system and out through the veins. Now additionally, we have to have somewhere for urine to go. So urine is made in that nephron and in the collecting duct, it is sent out through the renal pyramid and down into the minor calyces that combine together to make the major calyces and then finally, all the major calyces combine to make the renal pelvis. From there, it can exit and go down through the ureter into the bladder. The nephron is our major filtering unit as well as reabsorption unit of the kidney. So this is going to really be what allows us to maintain balance in the body. As you can see, there are so many of these little nephrons with their glomerulus attached, their loop of Henle, and so there are five portions that allow us to filter and reabsorb blood in order to send it through the collecting duct 
down to make urine. So the first is a proximal convoluted tubule. It has a convoluted portion, which is twisted up, and a straight portion. Then we have the loop of Henle. We have the descending limb over here and the ascending limb over here. Now the thick portion and the thin portion of the ascending limb have slightly different goals, and so we'll talk about that in a few moments. Next is the distal convoluted tubule, which is wrapped up right next to this glomerulus, and from there the collecting duct is what takes urine out of the body. Now for the glomerulus, this is a very important structure in the kidney. Now there are two different arterioles that we just talked about. One is the afferent arterial arriving at the glomerulus and the efferent arterial exiting the glomerulus. Now I know it looks like oxygenated versus deoxygenated blood, but I want you to think about it as filtered versus unfiltered blood. That's the glomerular capillary that's a tuft of small vessels that it leads into. Then there's mesangial cells, and I'll show you these on the next picture, but I want you to think that mesangial cells in the mesangial matrix are what holds the glomerulus in place, it separates those capillaries from one another. So if the glomerular capillary is this light bulb, then the mesangium is actually the part that screws into the ceiling. Additionally, there are three layers of filtration. Now we want a lot of stuff, especially toxic substances to be removed from the body, but there are a lot of things that we want to keep in the blood, such as large proteins and red blood cells. So there's three major layers of filtration in the glomerulus to become barriers for those larger substances from leaving. So the first is the endothelial cells, the second is the glomerular basement membrane, and the third is the podocytes in the slit diaphragm. Now this is the last line of defense, it's negatively charged, and it prevents proteins from passing. And I'll show you up close a picture of those. Now, out here is the Bowman cap Bowman's capsule, and that's what's gonna collect the uh, filtered blood, which is the first step to making urine. So here are some of those structures that we just addressed. Here's the efferent, afferent and efferent arterioles. Here's the mesangial cells and mesangial matrix that's essentially suspending this glomerulus. You have the glomerular capillaries with the epithelial cells. You can see that, um, I apologize, with the endothelial cells, which you can see right along here, as well as uh, right along here, those endothelial cells. Then you have the glomerular basement membrane right here in green. And finally, you have the podocytes here in blue. Podocytes, those are also called the visceral epithelial cells, which become important when you start talking pathophysiology of kidney diseases, but for now we'll just know them as podocytes. Here is the histological slide. Now your instructor likes to show histology because it helps to kind of see the true structures instead of just our cartoon animations, but it can also be kind of hard to interpret. So I want you to look right here. This is upside down compared to the picture I just showed you. Here's the vascular pole with the arterioles coming in. Then there's this big capsule right around here. That's Bowman's capsule. And all of this is glomerular capillary and it's intermixed with some of those mesangial cells, some of the mesangial matrix in order to suspend it. You've got podocytes, which you would normally zoom in on to be able to see them, endothelial cells, and a glomerular basement membrane. Now, I just want you to get a general overview of what that looks like. Once again, this is comparing it to our little cartoon. You have the vascular pull, the mesangial cells and matrix, the Bowman's capsule, and the glomerular capillary. This is a periodic acid shift stain as well. Now let's move on to the fluid compartments because 60% of the body is going to be water. And what's important about that is that we know where the water is. It helps us to determine how blood pressure is going to function, finding out where edema is coming from. A lot of clinical applications come from simply understanding how fluids move across these compartments. So if we have 60% of the body is water, then most of that is intracellular, two thirds. Only one third is located extracellularly. Then we come down and say, okay, of that extracellular fluid, where is it if it's not in the cell? Three fourths of it, or the majority of it, is interstitially. And then one fourth is intravascularly as plasma. So as long as fluid exists, it can shift between these compartments. And the way that it does that is 
through starling forces. This is what really is going to determine our fluid dynamics. So we start first with hydrostatic pressure, and that is the pressure that's determined by systemic blood pressure pushing out against the vessel walls, allowing fluid to be forced out. Now that doesn't sound great, right? We want fluid to stay inside this vascular space. So we have a counterbalancing pressure called oncotic pressure, or otherwise known as plasma colloid osmotic pressure. And this is composed of, of mainly solutes. The most important are large proteins like albumin. Um, and then minor contributors are sodium and other ions. And these two are going to work in balance with one another to keep an, the adequate amount of fluid inside the vessel. If one starts to outweigh the other, then we run into issues. Now, any of this fluid that's left in the interstitial space that we don't want there is going to be returned through the lymphatic ducts to the subclavian vein. Now, let's talk about renal measurements. These are really going to be crucial for your understanding. And I want to introduce first what they what they mean. What do we care about these different um, these different terms for? The first is renal clearance, and this is what we're going to focus the majority of our time on as well as GFR. But renal clearance is asking how much of the volume of plasma is cleared of a substance. Because like we said, the kidneys, one of their biggest goals is to clear substances, toxic substances from the body. The next is glomerular filtration rate. So we're asking how much of the fluid passes through this glomerular capillary and into the proximal tubule. How much is actually filtered? Renal plasma flow is asking how much fluid is coming in to the kidneys and actually being handled by the kidney. Now, you may see renal plasma flow and renal blood flow. Just know that renal plasma flow is 60% of renal blood flow because the rest is made up of red blood cells. And finally, I'm just going to touch on filtration fraction. Basically, what filtration fraction is, is so there may have been five liters that entered in through the blood vessel. However, only two liters of that was actually filtered in terms of our glomerular filtration rate. So really, we only filtered 40% of, of what's going on here. The rest is exiting through the efferent arterial. So this is just an example number. That's not how much we actually filter, but um, that's pretty much all I'll say about that so that you have an introduction to it. And finally, urine flow. That's determining how much fluid is coming out of the kidneys in the form of urine. Now, clearance. Clearance can be a difficult concept because you have both the blood and the urine to think about. But we want to focus only on clearance in terms of how much volume of plasma is cleaned of a substance. And this is determined in liters per minute. So know that what goes in the kidney must go out. It can either be excreted as urine, it can be returned to the vascular system, but we need to determine how much of the plasma that we were offered actually has a chance to run through the kidneys and be cleared. So your professor gives you this intense mass balance equation and does a bunch of algebra to get you to this equation. I just want you to remember C equals UVP. C U V over P. Now, each of these parts is extremely important. So we're asking how much of the clearance is happening. That means clearance of the plasma. U is going to be the concentration of the substance in the urine. V is the volume of urine passed per minute. And P is the concentration of the substance in the plasma. So of this concentrated substance in the plasma, how much is being removed from it? How much is being put into the urine? And how many liters of urine are we creating? So we can figure out how dilute or concentrated it is. Now, in terms of how we estimate clearance, it would take a lot of work for us to do exact measurements in those little tiny nephrons in the kidney. So we're gonna start only by estimating clearance based on easier lab values to obtain. For example, the plasma and collecting the urine. So I want you to think of clearance as being equal to GFR. Once again, clearance is equal to GFR. Basically, if we filter 100 milliliters of, per minute, 
then the substance that we're going to be measuring can, we say it would be cleared 100%. The reason is because the substance that we usually measure is creatinine. Now, creatinine is actually 100% freely filtered through the glomerulus. So it goes from in the blood into the glomerulus and into the tubules. And then we've, we say that virtually 0% is reabsorbed or secreted from the kidneys themselves. So over here we saw this equation where we have to account for how much of a substance may have been pushed through the kidneys but then was reabsorbed or secreted and that's that's too much to handle. So we use the substance creatinine which doesn't have either of those. Now we found out that that's not exactly true um, but based on how our lab values are measured we know how much creatinine is in the blood um, even though and, and urine even though there's very little secretion that does occur. Now creatinine is special because it has to stay extracellularly. It cannot go inside of the cell. So that allows us to really determine how much filtration is happening of the extracellular fluid. Now, the limitations of creatinine are that we usually would measure this in a 24-hour urine. We would determine, okay, if 100% is pushed from the blood into the urine, then how many units per day are we actually ending up with in the urine? And that would really help us. However, those tests can be pretty inaccurate because it is all dependent on user error. So whether or not they're actually able to collect all their substances, um, or how much they ate that day, how much they worked out, all those things shouldn't really change day to day, but they can influence our 24 hour urine. So we actually get a serum creatinine because it's a lot easier. Um, sometimes we'll still do spot creatinines, we'll, we'll do 24 hours, but very rarely. The second limitation is that it's, it's based on muscle mass. So we have to determine both body surface area and muscle mass because creatinine comes from a breakdown of muscle. Now, those with more muscle are going to have higher levels because there's a constant breakdown and rebuilding of our muscles. Additionally, individuals like elderly or, or female um, will have less muscle mass due to their level of testosterone and due to their um, muscle atrophy as they get older. The final one is that 20% will be secreted. I know that we talked about how we cut those out of the equation, but we found that about 20% is secreted. Um, so we know that our clearance equaling GFR kind of overestimates GFR. Now this was the most helpful thing that I was taught while studying the kidneys to understand the relationship between creatinine and GFR. And we're talking about serum creatinine. So creatinine, if it doubles in the blood, doubles in the blood, that means that we have the GFR. The reason is because if the levels are increasing in the blood, that means that we didn't remove them by the kidney. And usually that means that there's something wrong with the kidney. So if we're building up of this toxic creatinine substance inside the blood, then guess what? That means that it's a reflection of how our kidneys aren't working. So normal levels may be 0.8, but in chronic kidney disease, you can have levels of 2.0 and end-stage renal disease. I even saw people with levels of 8, 9, 10. Um, so kind of memorize this relationship because it can really help you understand serum creatinine versus the function of the kidney. Now your instructor gives you a lot of equations. Don't memorize these. It won't benefit you in the future, but do notice the differences. So for the Krokov Galt, you actually have measurement weight in kilograms. It accounts for this weight, and it also accounts for the fact that females have less muscle mass. However, the MDRD is what you're going to see on a um, CMP, a comprehensive metabolic panel or a basic metabolic panel, um, and it's going to calculate this estimated GFR. This is the equation that they use. Now, the issue with that is there's no weight accounted for here. So individuals who are overweight or obese um, or those who are severely underweight are going to have some differences that we can't account for. However, it does a good thing. It, it accounts for being female and it accounts for being African American, which is actually associated with higher muscle mass. And then finally, this equation was created for individuals who have sicker kidneys. So 
it's not valid for a GFR that's greater than 60 milliliters per minute. And when you think of GFR, I want you to think of the percent of the kidney that's functioning. So if your GFR is 100 milliliters per minute, then we say you have 100% renal function and above. You can definitely go above 100%, but that's just, you know, above 100. However, if you start getting kidney problems, you may have 70, 60, 50% of your kidney that's actually functioning appropriately as well as end-stage renal disease you get down below 15 percent of functioning kidneys so I want you to think of those two as essentially equivalent so this equation is not actually valid for a GFR greater than 60 percent meaning you have to have less than 60 percent of your kidney function but pretty much we assume that if this is over 60 percent then we're we're good unless there's acute injury happening or something we would expect now, for single nephron GFR, all this is saying is that we're measuring the amount of filtration at one nephron. And then when we combine and get these blood tests, we're actually combining all the nephrons together. And there are four major factors that are really determining how much is being filtered at each of these nephrons. The first is the capillary permeability and the surface area. The second is hydrostatic pressure in both the capillary and the tubule. Third is oncotic pressure in capillary and tubule, although I'll give you a hint, there is no oncotic pressure in the tubule. And number four is the dilation and constriction of both arterioles. The blood flow is related to pressure and resistance. If there's higher pressure and resistance, that's going to change the blood flow. Now, well, let's start with the capillary permeability. If there's increased permeability of the capillary, then we're going to allow more large substances to be lost. So in systemic infections like sepsis, there's vasodilation and increased capillary permeability. So that allows some of those bigger substances, which are supposed to remain in the glomerulus, to be released. Additionally, if you have local damage of the glomerulus, that's going to increase the permeability as well. Now, some of the things that decrease the permeability are chronic conditions such as end-stage renal disease or CKD because it's sclerosis and fibrosis, and that, that is a lot of pressure and resistance to move against um, in terms of filtration, so there's a lot less that's filtered. For hydrostatic pressure, normally we're going to equilibrate with oncotic pressure, so there's plenty pushing out and plenty pulling in. However, the capillary pressure is much higher than in the proximal tubule, so that creates a good environment for us to force fluid into the tubule to be easily filtered. However, if there's an obstruction in the tubule and something's blocked here, then that's going to increase the pressure and resistance in the tubule. It will back up and increase the pressure in the capillary, and then there will be less blood flow and a decreased GFR because of that high resistance in the tubule. As far as oncotic pressure goes, if there's increased oncotic pressure in this capillary area, there's more proteins in the blood and that means that fluid's going to want to stay in here. It's not going to want to leave. It's not going to want to move across because it wants to keep the appropriate concentration in the blood. So it moves right along and goes out the afferent arterial. However, if there's lower proteins in the blood, then it's already considered diluted and we lose more into the urine. The other thing to note is that there is no tubule oncotic pressure that's trying to balance between all of these different pressures because remember that protein and large macromolecules should not be in the tubule and so there should be no gradient down here created to offset the oncotic pressure. As far as the arterioles go, we addressed these just a moment ago, but if you dilate the afferent arterial, you're going to have more renal plasma flow and a higher hydrostatic pressure as it forces that fluid out, meaning that there's an increased GFR. If you constrict that blood vessel, then you're going to have less flow and a decreased GFR. Now, as far as the efferent arterial, this is controlling blood on the way out. So if you dilate, then more blood is allowed to return to the systemic circulation. 
that means that we're going to decrease the GFR because there's not as much pressure in here forcing it to be filtered because it's easily leaving the efferent arterial. If it's constricted, that's another story because we're decreasing the amount that's returned to the systemic circulation. So that means there's more time and pressure inside the capillary, which increases the GFR, but it also decreases renal plasma flow. So we may be filtering more, but we're not getting as much in and out. Now here's your graph for the single nephron GFR. This is what we just talked about. Now, as you go across this capillary, the pressure is going to change. These hydrostatic and oncotic pressures are going to change as they're moving water and substances across. So for hydrostatic pressure, it actually stays relatively constant because that's based on systemic pressure pushing against those walls. As far as oncotic pressure, at the beginning here, as you start to filter, you are concentrating the substances inside the capillary. So we're having higher protein to water ratio as the water and, and fluids are escaping out into the tubule. So that means this is super concentrated as we go across the capillary, which you can see right here. It goes from a lower pressure to a higher pressure as you remove that fluid. However, the GFR remains relatively constant because it's always trying to be in balance. Now, as far as regulation of these processes, the body is actually really good over a wide range of blood pressures. If one portion is messed up over here, if we have a lower blood pressure here, then the efferent arterial makes up for it. And usually these aren't isolated. You don't have one happen without the other. Usually it's a combination of decreasing one, increasing the other, or constricting both that allows us to get to the pressures that we want. Now, like I said, your body is very good at regulating those over a large period of time and a large period of blood vessels. But as those blood vessels or as, as that blood pressure starts to drop, then we start to get in a lot of trouble. This is where you're seeing sepsis and shock, where the GFR is dropping significantly in a short amount of time. So, We are going to try to use some of these different regulators in order to control the afferent and efferent arterial. And I want you to notice that norepinephrine and dopamine are on there. And those are actually what we use in the treatment of things like sepsis in order to maintain blood flow and maintain kidney flow and try and keep that mean arterial pressure up above 65. So we actually give this exogenously instead of making the body create it for itself. Now moving on, I just want to touch for a second on the RAS system. Now, um, there are different portions of the body where many of these products are created, but what I want you to focus on is that those are all sent and rely on the kidney for changing the blood pressure. So they may all interact in different ways, but they need to use the kidney to retain sodium and water to increase blood pressure and change the amount of blood flow. Now let's talk for just a second about volume depletion. So as you get volume depleted, you're gonna release some of these factors, such as renin, due to a decreased stretch in those arterioles. From there, that converts to angiotensin II, and you start to constrict the efferent arterial, causing increased pressure in the glomerular capillary because they want to maintain the GFR even though the blood flow rate is lower. So you can see that everything just slightly moves to different pressures even though this GFR stays the same. But after greater than 2% of volume depletion, then our kidneys start to panic. They think they're at risk for not getting perfused, and so, all of a sudden they release that norepinephrine and eventually it's too much and overwhelms that kidney causing the autoregulation to be lost. Now at that point we start to constrict both the afferent and efferent arterial which overall decreases glomerular blood flow um, and filtration rate. The reason it does this is because it says I would like any blood at all. If I tighten up those vessels, 
then I am at least creating enough pressure in that system to force blood into the kidneys. Otherwise, it's just vasodilated and the blood is sitting there doing nothing. So I want to summarize this with, there are three ways to change GFR. Pre-renally, you can change those starling forces, adjusting the oncotic and hydrostatic pressure. In chronic kidney disease, you change that capillary permeability with glomerular sclerosis. And finally, if there's ischemia or damage to the structures themselves, then the tubules may die and slough off into the lumen, causing obstruction, which, like we talked about, increases the pressure in the tubule and increases the hydrostatic pressure in, and eventually decreases the capillary permeability and the glomerular filtration rate. Now let's talk for one second um, about osmolality. Now you're going to hear this a lot throughout renal pathophysiology and it's because we talk about the number of particles of a solute in a solution instead of the weight or volume. We care about the number of particles. So look at solution A versus solution B. Let's pretend that A is sodium and B is B12. If you have more particles, even though sodium is smaller and, and has less pull than this B12, we still say that it has higher osmolality because there's one milligram of substance in both, one liter of water, everything else maintains the same. But A has a higher osmolality. Now the primary osmols that are excreted in the urine are going to be urea and sodium. Urea is the primary and sodium is secondary.